Okay, thanks, thanks, Natalia. So welcome everybody. Um, it's interesting and odd a little bit at the same time to do these things in this format, but we're really happy to have uh, uh, Tanya with us. And um, so I would like to thank her for doing this. Um, for you, some of you will probably almost none of you will know that uh, this was our second attempt at breaking Tanya out of Trump. So, so uh, first SAS decided, if you all recall, to go on strike and thwarted our first effort to bring her, which is more than a year ago now, although that seems like the distant past. And then we thought, no problem, we will have you now. Um, and now the world uh, seems to have uh, a different opinion. It's not SAS's fault per se. So unfortunately, Tanya, we're going to have to welcome you here uh, in a physical sense, as soon as this is done, we'll be very happy to have you. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, very briefly, uh, Tanya uh, needs very little introduction, but uh, Tanya Yonan is here, so thank you for, for agreeing to do this. She's a professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She's been there for quite, quite a long time. Uh, prior to that, she did, and this is when I met her, when we were both living in LA at the, uh, when she was doing a postdoc um, with uh, Maria Luisa uh, at uh, uh, University of Southern California. Um, Tanya is probably best known, and I think, you know, without exaggeration, I truly mean this, there is not a better comprehend, uh, comprehensive a program of work to look at uh, the semantics of, of articles in particular or the lack there of definiteness and specificity. This started, of course, with Tanya's dissertation, which she did at uh, MIT uh, with Ken Wexler and many other uh, very prolific people who've contributed to our field. Um, Tanya works on the formal linguistic side of this, so she's offered lots of insight as in terms of just understanding the formalisms. Uh, of, of this domain, but also uh, has done, I mean, a, a huge amount of work. I mean, I mean this very respectfully, but to say that with one domain, if it can be done, she's done it. And how do you for 20 years take one domain and do it? But of course, her work is not limited to that domain only. Uh, we know Tanya has contributed a lot specifically to, to the acquisition of semantics, syntax semantics interface. And without further ado, because I can tell you about all the board she's on from SSLA to bilingualism, language and cognition uh, lab, which is my personal favorite. Um, Tanya is definitely a superstar. So thank you for being here. I'm going to turn my mic off and over to you. Well, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Jason. I'm very happy to be here. I really wish I could be in Trump's in person. As Jason said, I've tried to do that twice and I hope it will happen someday. Um, but in the meantime, I'm very happy to have a chance to give um, this virtual lecture. So I will now share the screen so that I can show you my slides. Um, there we go. Can you see them? Yes? Okay. Um, okay. So um, I would like to talk about a variety of research projects um, that are being done in my lab, so to speak, although we don't really necessarily have a lab, but in my research group, um, work done by my, several of my graduate students as well as myself, which can all be subsumed largely under the heading of transferring universality in the second language acquisition of syntax semantics interface phenomena. Here are some of the major questions um, that the field of SLA can ask and has asked specifically about um, the syntax semantics interface. We start with the basic one, how do second language learners map linguistic form, the morphosyntax, to linguistic meaning, the semantics? Do they transfer form meaning mappings from their L1? Um, do they rely on semantic mechanisms and or semantic categories which are universally available regardless of the native language? Can learners acquire subtle form meaning mappings which are not um, learnable on the basis of the input alone? Um, all of these questions ultimately give us a fuller picture of how language is acquired in adulthood. And Romana Slavakova in her books has some nice overviews of the research done on those topics. <laughs> Another issue that I'm particularly interested in um, is the role of different kinds of knowledge um, in second language acquisition. Um, that is, um, 
Uh, traditionally, if we look back a few decades, SLA studies have used offline methodologies like grammaticality judgment tasks or fill-in-the-blank tests. However, much recent research, beginning with perhaps with work by Rod Ellis, has argued that such tasks are more likely to tap into very explicit knowledge by focusing learners' attention on form. Um, tasks that focus more on comprehension, like truth value judgments, for example, are somewhat more likely to tap into implicit knowledge, given that they focus on meaning. Yet another way to turn into learners' implicit knowledge, or perhaps into their automatized knowledge, is to tell them using online reaction time tasks. The one that we adopt in many of our projects is specifically self-based training. Of course, there are uh, various other tests as well, such as iTry. Ultimately, if we want to make conclusions um, about what learners know at an underlying implicit level, we need to be careful about the tests that we use and not to rely on just any one method. In this talk, I would like to give an overview of four different kinds of linguistic phenomena uh, that my students and I have been worked with. The first one is articles, as Jason said, you know, I started out, started my career working on articles and I am still, still doing some of that. So I'd like to talk about our projects on um, the acquisition and processing of English articles by Korean and Mandarin speakers. The second one, also very much in the domain of the noun phrase, um, plural marking, atomicity, the count mass distinction with that same population, Korean and Mandarin models of English. Third project is quantifier scope and specifically inverse scope in the acquisition of English by Mandarin speakers. And finally, two different projects um, on inter and anaphor interpretations, pronouns and reflexives in both English and Mandarin as a second. Here are the overarching questions that we ask in all of this work. First, what determines when transfer of form meaning mappings happens? Are all form meaning mappings equally subject to transfer? Um, even when a form is uh, in the L1 encodes the meaning only option. Or is L1 transfer only at work in the case of morphemes which, which occur obligatory? And also related, closely related to this, are there universal defaults that override a lot of The second question is, can second language learners acquire the target for meaning mappings in the second language that do not have an equivalent in their first language? Um, in, in the case of some for meaning mappings that we look at, they are in principle acquirable based on positive evidence alone. In such cases, um, does acquisition always take place as long as learners are immersed in the second language? Or if it doesn't take place, what might account for the lack of success? So the flip side of this is for four mini mappings that are not acquirable based on positive evidence alone, that also require negative evidence. Can acquisition still happen in the absence of classroom instruction? And if so, what mechanisms are at work? The third question is, do learners acquire explicit knowledge, uh, sorry, that's, that first explicit should be deleted. Do learners acquire knowledge of syntax semantics interface phenomena only at an explicit level, or do they manifest implicit knowledge as well? If we get at the same phenomenon using different kinds of tasks, do we get the same results, or um, do we find differences, and if so, what is this? So the first project I will discuss is the acquisition and processing of articles in English as a second language. This project is being, has been done for the past several years in collaboration with my graduate student, Sihi Choi, whose picture you see here. Um, and also um, for, some, for part of this project, visiting scholar Q Fin Liu uh, collaborated with us as well. Um, the goals of this project are to examine whether L2 English learners from article SL1s, Korean and Mandarin, can detect errors with articles, specifically missing articles, in both online processing and offline judgments, um, and also to examine whether we get any transfer from related phenomena, demonstratives and numerals, in this domain. We have used both a grammaticality judgment task and a self-paced reading task with adult Korean and Mandarin speakers who are learners of English in the so just to give a very brief overview, we know from much prior research, including work that I've done with my colleagues, that articles are very difficult for learners who come from article SL1s. Both errors of omission and errors of misuse um, have been widely tested. One limitation is methodological. A lot of the studies of articles in L2, including my own work, 
have will use fairly explicit tasks, such as fill in the blank or grammaticality judgments. Other studies rely on semi-naturalistic production where researchers don't really have control over the context. There have been a couple of studies that have used psycholinguistic methodologies um, and uh, Trenki et al. and Chandra Rani et al. And they actually have found that second language learners do exhibit um, sensitivity to articles on them. Um, in our study, our, one of our goals is to see whether this population of adult learners are sensitive to missing articles online as well as offline. To make this concrete, I will first show you the, the kind of phenomena that we are testing. So we have two separate experiments incorporated into a single task. The first one is an experiment on definites. Here we vary the type of definite, whether it's anaphoric, previous mention, or whether it's bridging. And we also vary whether the sentence is grammatical with an article or ungrammatical with the article absent. So to give um, the concrete example, um, the anaphoric condition would be John bought a new monitor. This morning he cleaned the monitor with a cloth. So we need the upon the second use of monitor because it's second use. The monitor is being mentioned for the second time. In the bridging condition, we have John bought a new computer. This morning, he cleaned the monitor with a cloth. In this case, there is no previous mention of the word monitor. However, the monitor is definite by virtue of bridging from a computer. Since there is a computer mentioned, we know that a computer um, has a monitor, so that's the monitor that's being referred to. Um, so in our experiment, we presented participants with these sentence pairs, anaphoric versus bridging, with an article versus with a missing article. So in the ungrammatical condition, we have simply he cleaned monitor with a cloth. In, a, in our grammaticality judgment tasks, participants see both sentences, the full sentence pair, and make a judgment of what yes or no is the separate sentence. In the self-paced reading task, participants read the first sentence, the context sentence, like John bought a new monitor, as a whole, and then the target sentence is read word by word. And we measure reading times at the noun itself. So when the participant gets to the word monitor, either it follows the article or it follows the verb directly. In the latter case, we have an error, so we expect participants to slow down because there's no article in front of the word monitor. And then exactly the same procedure for the indefinite portion of our experiment, different set of sentences. In this case, the target article is A. Again, we either have A present or A missing. And we also vary referentiality. So in the referential conditions, we have Mary felt lonely last week, so she finally got a cat from a shelter. A cat is referential. It refers to a specific cat that Mary got. In the non-referential condition, we have Mary feels lonely this week, so she may get a cat from a shot. In this case, a cat is non-referential because there is no particular cat that's being discussed. The cat is only in Mary's imagination. So again, same procedure. In the self-based reading task, participants read the context sentence in its entirely, and then advance through the target sentence word by word. When they get to the word cat, if it is not preceded by an article, they should be surprised and should um, consequently slow down. So that's, these are the phenomena we are tested. I mentioned before that we're also interested in the role of L1 transfer. Even though Korean and Mandarin are both languages without articles, they do have some ways of marking definiteness as well as indefiniteness. Both languages have demonstratives, which are used quite widely with definiteness, in fact, more widely than demonstratives in English. Both languages also have the numeral one, which is often used with indefinites. In the case of definites, both Korean and Mandarin tend to prefer to use bare entries, that is just the noun, just the word monitor with no um, article in front of it, no determinant in front of it, in bridging contexts. But for anaphoric definites, the preference is to put in a demonstrative. Um, who in Korean, nine Mandarin, which are roughly equivalent to the English set. We did test native speakers of these languages experimentally, and we find that preferences are stronger in Korean. Mandarin generally uses demonstratives more than Korean does, even with bridging definites. <coughs> in the case of indefinites, Mandarin tends to prefer to use the numeral one with referential indefinites, 
and the bare entry with non-referential ones. In Korean, the strong preference is to use the bare entry, to not use one plus classifier in a kind of sentences. Again, these are preferences. Both Korean and Mandarin do freely allow their entries. But let's say that preferences are subject to transfer. What would that mean? Well, it would mean that cloners would expect a determiner with those entry types that preferentially take some kind of a determiner or numeral in their native language, and should consequently be more sensitive to a missing article in English in such contexts. Going by the facts of Korean and Mandarin, in the case of definites, both groups should be more um, accurate with anaphoric than with bridging definites, and this has actually been found in previous offline work by J.C. Cho. Furthermore, um, we expect Mandarin speakers to be more accurate than Korean speakers, even with bridging definites, because that's demonstratives are used more in Mandarin than in Korean in such cases. In the case of indefinites, um, Mandarin speakers should be more accurate in referential than in non-referential context and should be overall more accurate um, than Korean speakers because Mandarin uses numerals. Alternatively, um, if there are no transfer effects, um, we expect to see very similar performance in both the Korean and the Mandarin group across context across the languages. So here are first our re offline results for the grammaticality judgment tasks. Um, I'm not sure how well um, everything in the graph shows up, but basically what we, so the first, the, the red bars um, are the native English speakers, the yellow and kind of greenish bars um, are the learner groups, Chinese and Korean. When it comes to grammatical sentences with both definites and indefinites, everybody's at ceiling, they accept all the sentences. When, however, it comes to ungrammatical sentences, we see a huge amount of overacceptance. The Korean and the Chinese speakers um, accept sentences with missing the or a at the rate of about 80%. They do make a small distinction between grammatical and ungrammatical sentences, but it is just not a very small. We see no differences across conditions. We see no differences across the native. Here are the self-based treating data, maybe a little hard to read, so basically, what we have, English speakers slow down equally with both types of definites. So the solid lines correspond to the grammatical conditions, the dotted lines correspond to the ungrammatical conditions. So basically when English speakers get to the word monitor, if there was no there in front of monitor, they read more slowly than if there was there in front of monitor. Sorry, the effect actually is not at the word monitor itself, but at the following word. In the spillover region, there is a clear effect. The lot is also, the lot of data are messier, which you'd expect with auto populations. There's a lot more variability, but nevertheless, they do exhibit the same kind of slowdown. The slowdown is greater with anaphoric than with bridging definites, um, uh, but it is there. In both conditions, both groups of learners do detect errors with this. Turning to indefinites, all groups are much better at detecting missing A with referential than with non referential indefinites. Even native English speakers barely recognize missing A with non-referential enough. And I don't want to go into that now, but I'm happy to talk about that later if, if you have questions. Um, again, no real differences between the two groups. The two groups. They both have a clear slowdown with referential than, and not with non-referential. So to sum up, we actually find in, very interestingly that our learners do better online than offline have a huge amount of overacceptance of missing articles in the offline task, in the GGT, but in the self-paced tweeting task, they actually quite successfully slow down with missing, for missing articles. The results are barely compatible with online transfer. Offline, we see no transfer effects whatsoever. Learners do exactly the same, perform exactly the same across conditions. Online, when it comes to indefinites, again, all groups behave the same. Mandarin speakers do not have any advantage over Korean speakers in detecting missing A, despite the fact that Mandarin marks, lexically marks indefinites much more so than Korean. When it comes to definites in the self-based reading task, that is the only place um, where we see a little bit of a transfer effect, in that both learner groups are more target with anaphoric than with bridging definites, which is consistent with demonstratives in their native languages, preferentially marking anaphoric definites. However, as I mentioned earlier, demonstratives are much more widely used in Mandarin than in Korean, 
and yet we see absolutely no difference between the two. <coughs> so in light of practically no group and practically no condition differences, we conclude that there is no L1 transfer in these domains. That learners have to essentially learn English articles from scratch and not fall back on the meanings of demonstratives and numerals in their native language. One reason why we think there is no transfer here is because the demonstratives and numerals, unlike articles, are optional elements. And it's quite possible that the meanings of optional elements are simply not subject to transfer, are not mapped to elements that are obligatory in the algebra, such as articles. <coughs> okay, now I would like to pass on to the second study um, done by my research group. Same collaborator, um, my student Sihi Choi. In this, this time, she is the main author. This is work, uh, this is basically her dissertation research, as well as various publications that have um, ha arisen out of her dissertation. In this project, we're looking at the acquisition and processing of the count mass distinction and plurality in English as a second language, again, working with Korean and Mandarin. So we're looking at native languages which do not have obligatory plural marking, and we want to see whether they're able to acquire plural marking in English and whether they can detect errors with plural marking online as well as offline. So again, we use judge, both offline judgments and self -based. And again, we have multiple groups um, of adult Korean and Mandarin speakers, one in English in the So to give first a little bit of background for this phenomenon, um, the object substance distinction um, is part of our conceptual system. Some nouns denote substances. We tend to think of water or oil or mustard as a substance. Other nouns denote objects, something like a chair or a pencil or a book is universally denoted as an object. So um, in some cases, the mapping is very clear. You have mass nouns like water denoting substances and count nouns like chair denoting objects. But a lot of other nouns are flexible. Um, for example, in English, we have chocolate as a mass noun if we want to talk about the substance. We also have chocolates as a count noun for talking about you know, particular chocolate candies. Stone is, both, is a material while stones are specific. There's been a lot of work on this by Barner and colleagues who used a comprehension task, a quantity judgment task, to see how speakers of different languages, as well as second language learners, um, interpret different kinds of nouns. And they find a lot of evidence for universality. Whatever the native language, whether or not it has plural marking or a clear count mass distinctions, clearly substance denoting nouns like mustard or oil are judged by volume. So when, in those experiments, if a participant is presented with a picture of two big blobs of mustard versus six tiny blobs of mustard and asked where is more mustard or who has more mustard, they go for the two big blobs, so more volume. On the other hand, objects are judged by numbers. So in a choice between two huge chairs of six tiny ones, speakers of very different languages, including English and Japanese, go for, do, go for the six tiny ones. They judge um, chairs by objects. Interestingly, in English, even though furniture is a mass noun, it denotes objects, and English speakers, just like speakers of various other languages, judge it by, um, by, by number, not by volume. The one place where there are cross-linguistic differences is in the case of flexible nouns like stones. Um, so there is all this prior findings about quite a bit of universality in how people interpret um, the meaning of mass and count. What we're interested in is the reverse side of this, the use of count mass morphosyntax for semantically very different words. Um, in a plural marking language like English, we do get um, some, now, a lot of the nouns kind of reflecting their meaning directly. Mass nouns like water or oil are mass. Sorry, I denote substances. Count nouns like chair or dog denote objects. But there's also lots of variability. Nouns like furniture, jewelry, or cutlery, which denote heterogeneous collections of objects, can, both, can potentially be either count or mass. So even in English, shoes and footwear are practically synonymous, but shoes is a count noun, footwear is a mess. Um, nouns like chocolate or spinach or stone, which, do, which can potentially name a substance or material, but also can name objects, depending on how they're used, 
such nouns exhibit loss of cross-linguistic as well as intralinguistic variation. So for example, beans, bean, beans is a count noun in English, it's equivalent in Russian, fasol is mess. Spinach is mess in English, it's equivalent in French is count. Nouns like string or chocolate or stone can be mass account even with it. So this is a place where there is much more variability. Languages like Korean and Mandarin, which don't have obligatory plural marking, don't have a fully grammaticized count mass distinction, um, behave somewhat differently with respect to count mass nouns. Even though both Korean and Mandarin are, gener are classifier languages without obligatory plural marking, they do both have plural marking and it behaves quite differently. In particular, the Korean tool marker is quite widely used. It's compatible with pretty much any noun which can denote, roughly speaking and formally speaking, an object, an atomic or bounded entity. So nouns which are counted in English, like chair or dog, are compatible with tool in Korean. Nouns which are mass in English but denote objects like furniture can also take two in Korean. Um, only nouns like sunlight or mustard, which can only name substances, those nouns do not readily take two in Korean. So the relationship between the plural marker and the meaning of the noun seems to be much more direct in Korean than in English. Any noun that can potentially name an object can occur. Situation with men is quite different. Uh, the man in Mandarin, sorry. The Mandarin plural suffix man is highly restricted. It's only used with plus human NPs. We're here in our study, we only look at minus human inanimate NPs. So there is plural marking in Mandarin is simply ungrammatical in all such <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as, part, as one of her dissertation studies, um, Si Hee Choi administered grammaticality judgment tasks to Korean speakers in Korean and to English speakers in English to see when they would find singular versus plural nouns acceptable. Well, in English, the picture is very clear. Nouns like furniture can only are grammatical in singular form, ungrammatical in plural. Noun like beans are grammatical in the plural, ungrammatical in the singular. Only nouns like chocolates, chocolates, chocolates can potentially be both singular. Korean is different in the sense that it freely allows both singular and plural forms with nouns like furniture and to a smaller extent, but also allows both singular and plurals with beans and with chocolates and with spinach. So in general, in Korean, singular forms are always grammatical because it's plural marking is always optional, at least on indefinites and other attached definites in the start. Um, but plural marking is differentially available. Um, the only place it's really rated low is with true substance. So those are the basic facts of English and Korean. Now turning to acquisition, what form might L1 transfer take? Well, it's quite possible if Korean speakers transfer the meaning of tool onto the English plural S, then we'd expect they would allow and use plural S in English for all nouns that are in principle compatible with tool in Korean. They would be correct in the case of noun like chair, but they would be, or beans, but they would be incorrect in the case of nouns like furniture or Mandarin learners of English, on the other hand, have no reason whatsoever to over to to over accept plural s in English. If anything, they should not use or allow s at all, since it's highly restricted. In so that would be the predictions based on L1 trends. Alternatively, it's possible that we would not see transfer in this domain, but that instead both Korean and Mandarin speakers should fall back on the semantic universal of atomicity. That is, simply assume that S is compatible with any object denoting atomic nouns, um, independently of their own. Um, so in our first series of studies, the first part of CG's dissertation, um, we tested this prediction specifically with object mass nouns like furniture. So here is a sample talking set. We have sentences such as, at the store, Mary bought furniture for her family versus at the park, Jill enjoyed sunlight for a while. These are both fully grammatical. In the ungrammatical variants, we add a plural S. At the store, Mary bought furniture's plural for her family. At the park, Jill enjoyed sunlight's plural for her. The addition of plural S makes the sentences completely ungrammatical for native English speakers. So we expect them to slow down when encountering furniture's or sunlight or other uh, either right on the word or in the spill of word. So again, just as in the previous experiment I showed um, with the self-based reading task, we present these sentences one word at a time. 
And we examine whether participants will slow down at the word with an incorrect S on it, or alternatively um, at the following scale of range. And we use residual reading times to control for the fact that that little letter S makes the word wrong. Here are the results of our offline grammaticality judgment task. When it comes to atomic object mass nouns like furniture, our Lona groups make no distinctions whatsoever. They found to be furniture and furnitures to be equally acceptable at about 76-78%. Both Korean and Mandarin groups. They have no recognition whatsoever that that S doesn't belong. When it comes to sunlight versus sunlights, we do see a distinction. Lotus still over accept sunlights relative to native speakers, but they do recognize that sunlight singular is much better than sunlight. Turning to the online results, I know this might be a little hard to read, but basically we see exactly the same picture. Native English speakers slow down both for sunlights and for furnitures. Interestingly, in the case of non-atomic nouns like sunlights, they slow down right at the word itself. In the case of furnitures, it takes them a minute, well, not a minute, a few more like a um, couple hundred milliseconds. Um, they slow down at the following word, rather than at the spill of a region instead of the correct language. So that's the case for the English speakers. Chinese and Korean groups show exactly the same picture. In the case of the non-atomic conditions with sunlight, they reliably slow down when encountering the plural form relative to the sun. In the case of furnitures, numerically there is a tiny slowdown, but it doesn't anywhere reach it's for right. So both groups behave exactly the same and furthermore behave exactly the same online as offline. They're sensitive to the oversupplies of plural S with substance mass, non-atomic nouns like sunlight. They recognize that sunlight is ungrammatical, both offline and online. However, for nouns like furnitures, they exhibit no slowdown in the SPRT, no rejection in the GGT. So our findings actually fully replicate our earlier study, which used a different offline methodology and show that Korean and Mandarin groups do not differ in this domain. Um, they accept mass now, um, object mass nouns like furniture with plural S, regardless of the text. There doesn't seem to be any L1 transfer here. Even though Korean uses plural marking with nouns like furniture and Mandarin does not, the two groups are equally accepted, accepted, accepting of the plural S um, on furniture. Excuse me. Um, a study by other authors, Tang et al., coming out of Ellis and Gabriel's lab, they have replicated um, our offline study um, with Chinese and French speakers learning English, and they did find transfer for the French, uh, but not for the Chinese. So that suggests that in the domain plural marking, transfer only takes place um, when both the L1 and the L2 are plural marking languages. However, for generalized classifier languages, there is no transfer in this domain. Um, Instead, learners fall back on semantic units. I will very quickly work through a follow-up study, um, this, the last set of experiments in CK's dissertation, where we extended this research to um, other noun types. So we've look, we'll, here we look at nouns which are, in, one of, in the first experiment of flexible, we look at nouns that are obligatorily count in any language, so a noun like laptop, which always denotes an object, Flexible nouns like peas. In English, peas is a count noun, but in other languages, it's a mass noun. So it's, it's one of those nouns that's considered to be flexible. And finally, we have chocolate or chocolates as the control, the baseline, because that actually does allow both singular and plural forms of English. So we examine where the learners will, will, will notice errors of missing S on both regular count nouns and on count nouns that are cross linguistically flexible. We find that the answer um, is that they only detect this with count nouns. This, sorry, this slide doesn't have all the statistics, but basically English speakers reliably slow down when laptop or P is missing an S, but apparently happened with chocolates, for chocolates to be missing an S. But Lona's, both Korean and Mandarin, make more of a distinction with laptops than with any other kind. Um, the same holds online. Again, these are very hard to read, but just to briefly summarize, Native speakers slow down for missing S for both laptops and P's, but learners only for 
in a companion experiment, um, we examined flexible mass nouns. So here the focus is on nouns like spinach, which are mass in English but count in other languages. So here we want to see whether learners will recognize that the S on spinach is incorrect. We compare it to true mass nouns like sunlight and again to flexible nouns like chocolate. And the picture is about the same. <laughs> English speakers reliably slow down for both sunlight and spinaches. Learners do so for sunlights much more than for spinaches. Sorry, that was, um, sorry, in the GJT, I mean, the English speakers reliably reject sunlights and spinaches. Learners reject sunlights more than spinaches. And same thing in the self-based tweeting task. Um, learners reliably slow down only for spinaches. So basically what we find is exactly the same thing that we found with structure. Our learners are fully, both Korean and Mandarin speakers, are fully accepting of both singular and plural forms for all flexible nouns. Not just for those that truly are flexible in English, like chocolates, but also for those that are flexible cross-linguistically, like peas and spinach, as well as French. Um, so overall, taking acro um, across all of these experiments, we find no effects of element transfer. Korean and Mandarin speakers behave exactly the same, even though Korean plural marking is much more productive and is compatible with any object denoting noun, while Mandarin plural marking is completely restricted, not used with inanimate nouns at all, these two populations behave exactly the same in English across different tasks and across all types of different nouns tested, um, in that they are happy to allow S with any noun which is potentially object denoting, like spinach or furniture or beans. Um, the only nouns on which they reject as obligatorily are nouns like sunlight or mustard, which denote such persons. Okay. So, two experiments now in the nominal domain with articles and plural marking, which speak against L1 transfer. Now, I want to turn to a, a somewhat different phenomenon, still involves um, noun phrases, but now the focus is on the interpretation of the entire sentence. Um, and this is scope in L to English. This study is being conducted in collaboration with my graduate students, Mian Jen Wu. Um, it's eventually going to become her dissertation. Um, here we are focusing on Mandarin speakers acquiring quantifier scope in English, and the tasks that we've used are truth value judgment tasks. So we've run two experiments. Um, one on quantifier negation scope, and one, the other one is a double quantifier scope. So, first to make the phenomena concrete. Um, so forget about articles and plural marking now and focus on quantifiers instead. The first, in, in our first experiment, we examined the interaction between a quantifier in subject position and sentential negation. So these will be sentences such as, every sheep did not jump over the fence, or it's near equivalent, all the sheep did not jump over. These sentences have two interpretations. On the surface scope reading, the interpretation is, every, for every sheep, that sheep did not jump. So if we look at the context that we're calling the non-context, this is actually our experimental context, Evan had a group of sheep on his farm. One day he wanted to train them to jump over a fence, but the fence was too high, so no sheep was able to jump over it. So the sheep started out on one side of the fence, and they stayed there, nothing changed. Um, so in this set context, it is true that every sheep failed to jump over the fence. Compare this to a partial context. There were four sheep eating grass on the field. Two of them wanted to eat the grass on the other side of the fence, so they jumped over. The other two stayed at the original side of the fence. So we had four sheep all on one side, and then after the jump, we had two sheep on one side, two on. In this case, the surface scope reading of the sentence, every sheep failed to jump over the fence, is false. Um, however, in English, it's also possible to get the inverse scope reading of the sentence, to interpret negation above the quantity. In that case, the meaning becomes, it is not the case that all the sheep jumped. Well, that's true in both of those contexts. In the non-context, it's not the case that all the sheep jumped, because none of them did. In a partial context, it's not the case that all the sheep jumped because some did and some didn't. So this partial context is what really helps us disentangle the surface scope and the inverse scope. 
if participants accept this sentence, every sheep didn't jump over the fence in the partial context, that suggests that they can access English. In our second experiment, we look at a different scope configuration with an indefinite quantifier in subject position and a universal quantifier in object position, such as a dog scared every man or with a different indefinite one dog scared every man. The surface scope reading is there is a specific dog which scared all the relevant men. So if we look at the single agent context, that's, that reads, there were three stray dogs under a tree. One day, one of the dogs chased the three men who walked by the tree, and the three men ran away terrified. The other two dogs simply stayed under the tree, sharing the dog. So this, the surface scope reading, one specific dog scared all the men, is true. Compare this to the pair list context. There were three vicious dogs in this neighborhood, My, uh, Rocky, Milo, and Gus. This morning, Rocky scared the businessman. Milo scared a man with glasses, and Gus scared a delivery man. All three men were checked. So in this case, the surface scope reading, there is one specific dog that scared every man, is actually false, because the dogs are different. But again, for English speakers, <coughs> this sentence also has an inverse scope reading. Excuse me. For every man, there is at least one dog that scared it. That reading is true, both in the single agent context. For every man, there is a dog that scared him. It just happens to be the same dog. And it's also true in the parallelist context. For every man, there is a dog that scared him, and the dogs are all different. So once again, <coughs> in the parallelist context is where we can disentangle the surface scope and the inverse scope. Again, we're interested in transferring this domain. It's been, it's been shown across multiple studies, both offline and online, that English speakers do permit both surface scope and inverse scope readings for these sentence types even though surface scope is preferred. On the other hand, Mandarin is a scope rigid language. In both of these configurations, the inverse scope reading is completely ungrammatical, only the surface scope reading is locked. There is some prior work, notably by Heather Marsden, that has found transfer in the domain of corner by scope with other L1, L2 combinations. In this case, the task of the Mandarin speakers learning English is to add a reading. Surface scope is available in both of their languages, inverse scope only in the L2. So in principle, it should be possible for them to acquire inverse scope by attending to those contexts in English where the relevant sentences show up with an inverse scope. However, these contexts are likely to be quite infrequent. So it's not clear that the positive evidence here is really enough for the learners to get the relevant interpretations. In our series of studies, we tested our participants, our learners in Mandarin, as well as in English, in order to really be, compare how they behave in the L1 and the L2 and to fully examine L1 traits. These are the results. So first, for quantifier negation interactions, so these are sentences like, every sheep didn't jump over the fence. We compare all the sheep with every sheep. They behave exactly the same. The black bars correspond to how much, so these are acceptability ratings from a scale from one to four. The black bars correspond to the context which make the surface scope reading true. The gray bars correspond to the context which make only the inverse scope readings true. So native English speakers are happy to accept these sentences on their surface scope readings, and so other ones, close to ceiling performance. On the inverse scope readings, while English speakers definitely have a preference um, for surface scope, but they're still accepting of inverse scope. They still prefer surface scope significantly, but crucially, they rate the sentences on their inverse scope readings significantly higher than the lowest. The lowest behave about the same when tested in English and when tested in their native language manual. In both languages, they largely reject sentences on the inverse scope. Although the rejection rate is a little bit lower in the Mandarin than in English, suggesting that maybe they're just beginning to get the inverse scope. But the differences are very nice. Pretty much the same picture on our other experiment with double quantifier interactions. A dog scared every man. Native English speakers prefer surface scope, but are happy to allow inverse scope, especially with a dog scared every man. A little more reluctant to allow inverse scope with one dog scared. Lonas, when tested in either English and Man or Mandarin, they're all one, are much more categorical, really disallow um, the inverse scope reading. Although, again, they're slightly more accepting of it in their own two than in their own. 
So in this case, the findings are fully compatible with L1 transfer. Our learners completely failed to acquire inverse scope in English. They replicate um, earlier work by Chu et al. who looked at learners in Taiwan. We looked at learners in the US who get a lot more English exposure than the ones in Taiwan and yet are still not um, accepting an inverse scope. So that suggests that the positive evidence in the input that these learners receive is not sufficient for acquisition. These were quite advanced participants immersed in an English environment, still did not recognize that English permits inverse scope. Finally, I want to move on to our last set of studies um, on anaphora interpretation, anaphora interpretation. The first of these is about L2 English. This is work by Yun Hee Kim, who um, graduated um, with a PhD um, last December, oh, sorry, a year or last August. Um, so this was her 2019 dissertation. Um, her dissertation looked at how Korean uh, speaking learners of English interpret pronouns both in their L1 and in their L2. Um, here I will talk about her truth value judgment test. She also had a so half the dissertation was about eye tracking and pronoun resolution, but I will not touch on that today. So she looked at Korean learners of English in the US, as well as native English speakers. The focus of her dissertation is on local versus long distance readings of pronouns. So in English, if we take a sentence such as Jane said that Mary painted her, her can be Mary, her cannot be Jane. Pretty basic fact. Um, Chomsky captured this on principle B of binding theory, which says that a pronoun cannot be bound within a local domain, which in English is roughly a case. Um, Tanya Reinhardt in her work um, argued that there are actually two different ways in which um, pronouns can be interpreted. On the bound variable reading, um, pro a pronoun is referentially dependent on its antecedent. This is licensed in the grammar, and this is where principle B comes. However, pronouns can also obtain co-referential readings, um, which are licensed by the discourse bypassing the grammar. So let's make this a bit more concrete. If we have a sentence with a referential antecedent, such as Mary thinks that she is a genius, we actually have not two, but three possible interpretations. One is that she is a bound variable co-indexed with Mary. So she has to be Mary. Alternatively, she gets a different index than Mary and refers to some other person, J. However, there is a third option. She gets a different index than Mary. Mary is indexed one, she is indexed two, but by accident, one and two refer back to the same person who is Mary. This is where we get accidental correference. Normally, this is ruled out. Um, Brzezinski and Reinhardt propose that it is ruled out by rule I. Um, which is a discourse-based pragmatic. But there are some specialized contexts where accidental coreference can occur. Crucially, accidental coreference is only possible when we have a referential antecedent like men. If we replace it with a quantificational antecedent like every girl, there is no such thing as accidental coreference. This is because every girl does not pick out some entity in the discourse. The only way um, to, so if she picks out, she gets a different index than every girl, then it simply picks out some other individual. Every girl thinks that she is a genius, she is not. Alternatively, if she is a bound variable, it is bound by every girl. So it, every girl thinks that she is a genius, means that for every girl, that girl thinks that that girl is a genius. Okay. So here are the basic facts of English. For adult English speakers, in a sentence like Mary painted her, her cannot be Mary. This is ruled out both by principle B and by pragmatic rule I. There is lots of first language acquisition research which has suggested that ch children actually violate rule I or some similar pragmatic principle because there is evidence that children do allow her to be Mary in a sentence like Mary painted her, but don't allow this for every girl painted her. This has been argued by Chen and Wexler in much subsequent literature to be a pragmatic problem. Um, however, interestingly, the same phenomenon has been observed for adult Korean speakers learning English, for whom arguably there is no pragmatic problem to speak of, these are adults. Um, and yet, Korean speakers learning English have been found in previous studies, such as the Chapter 97, 
to over accept sentences like Mary painted her where her maid. <coughs> Yun Shi Kim in her dissertation hypothesized that this is a result of L1 transfer from Korean and that rule I is not oppressive in Korean. In a Korean, local pronouns actually can refer to a local referential antecedent. So this hypothesis was tested in both English and Korean using a truth value judgment task. I know this is a, um, a very busy slide. I'm not going to read through all the context, but basically what is being varied here, on the one hand is whether we have a referential antecedent like Jessica or a quantificational one like every girl, and also whether that antecedent is local or long distance. So in English, if we have a sentence like, every girl said that Jessica thought highly of her, her cannot be Jessica. So it should be, the sentence should be rejected if the context makes it clear that her is Jessica. But her can be every girl, no problem. Flipping the two, if we have Jessica said that every girl thought highly of her, for English speakers, her can only be every girl, cannot be Jessica. So, um, in English, the judgments are very straightforward, but for Korean, the expectations are somewhat different. So if the relevant sentence is, every girl said that Jessica thought highly of her, if the context suggests that her is Jessica, English speakers should reject this, but Korean speakers, both tested in Korean and in English, might actually accept this. Because if rule I is not operative, Korean actually does permit her to be Jessica, does permit a local antecedent. Crucially, this, this is predicted only for referential entities. If instead we have Jessica said that every girl thought highly of her, and the context makes it every clear that her means every girl, in English this is completely unacceptable. It should be unacceptable in Korean as well. A quantificational antecedent should not be possible in the local. On the other hand, non-local long-distance antecedents, those should be equally available in English. Here are the results for both English speakers and learners tested in English. So if we start with context C, every girl said that Jessica thought highly of her. The context indicates that her means every girl. This is fully acceptable and both English speakers and learners are very accepting, basically saying true, yes. Every girl said, uh, said that Jessica thought highly of her. Context indicates that her means every girl. Yes, the sentence is true, no problem. On the opposite side, we have context B. Jessica said that every girl thought highly of her. The context again makes it clear that her is every girl. That's terrible in, and both native English speakers and learners of Korea, um, Korean learners of English completely reject this thing, no, this is false. Where we start seeing group differences are in the two middle contexts, A and D, with referential entities. Every girl said that Jessica thought highly of her. English, where the context makes it clear that her is Jessica. English speakers say no, that's false. But Korean speakers are almost a chance. About half the time they say, yeah, that's true. So they are happy for Jessica as a local antecedent. And on the flip side, when the sentence is, Jessica said that every girl thought highly of her, condition D, English speakers say that's great, her can be Jessica, sure. Korean speakers only allow that half the time. So basically where the antecedent is referential, Korean speakers don't really care if it's local or not. Now let's see if this is due to L1 transfer. Here are the same learners, again, the data that we've just seen when the learners tested on their English versus when they tested in their native language Korean. The results are very similar. In particular, the tendency to accept Jessica thought highly of her where her is Jessica. Learners exhibit that tendency in their native language as well as in their second. At the same time, they are a little bit different. They, their English performance is a little bit, it kind of, it's kind of halfway between how they perform in Korean versus how native English speakers perform in English. So I know that that was a lot of information and I'd be happy to answer questions about it um, later on, but just to summarize, this is what the study basically found. English speakers behaved as, exact, as expected. They accepted only long distance readings of pronouns. Korean speakers tested in Korean, however, over-accepted referential readings, regardless of whether they were local or long distance, which is consistent with Wulai not being operative in Korean. They were rather more categorical with quantification. 
Korean learners of English exhibited evidence of L1 transfer. They overaccepted local readings with referential antecedents and even underaccepted them with long distance quantification. However, the fact that the learners were about halfway between their performance in Korean and the performance of native English speakers in English suggests that recovery is taking place in this time. And the final study, which is kind of a follow up to Kim's work, or at least closely related to it, uh, is work by my final graduate student, Chun Yu Chen. This is a portion, a small portion of her dissertation, where she is looking at Anna for interpretation in Mandarin as a second language. So, so far, we've only been looking at English as a second language, but Ch Chung Yu's work is on Mandarin. And she's looking at how English as well as Korean speakers interpret anaphores in Mandarin, uh, again, using truth value judgments. So, um, here we expand the domain from pronouns like her and him to reflexes like herself and his. In English, reflexes must be local. Mary saw herself. Is herself is Mary, and her pronouns cannot be local. Right? That's captured by principle A versus principle B. Mandarin and Korean have a much greater variety of reflexes. Both of them have complex reflexes, Tazinji in Mandarin, Kachikasin in Korean, which are just like English herself, only local. However, both of these languages also have simplex reflexes, Ziji in Mandarin, Kachi in Korean which do allow both long distance as well as local. Finally, both of these languages also have pronouns, Korean pronoun ties pretty much like the English pronouns. In the case of, sorry, the Mandarin pronoun ties just like the English pronouns. As we just saw from Kim's, Yuri Kim's dissertation, Korean pronouns are rather different. They are willing to allow local. So this summarizes the facts. Pronouns in all three languages have long distance readings, but the Korean ones also have local readings. Complex reflexes in all three languages only have local readings. Simplex reflexives are absent in English, but in Mandarin and Korean allow both local and long distance readings. So this is definitely a place where Korean learners of Mandarin might behave quite differently than English learners. <laughs> in the truth value judgment task, participants would see pictures. So in this sample, they would see a picture I, of John saying something. It's the same bubble. John says that Peter painted somebody. So in the picture, you have John saying that Peter painted John, or John saying that Peter painted Peter. In the center, if you, the truth value judgment task, the examples here are given in English, but the actual task was in Mandarin. So if the sentence was John said that Peter drew him, that is ta, that's True in this case, because John said that Peter drew John, but false in this case, because Ta cannot mean himself. If the sentence is John said that Peter drew Taziji himself, this is false, A is false, B is true. So the sentence is false with A and true. Finally, if John said that Peter drew Ziji, because Ziji allows both local and long distance readings, we expect native Mandarin speakers to accept that sentence. What about Lawrence? Well, with pronouns, English speakers, if they recognize that Ta means him, A is true, the sentence is true with A false with B. But for Korean speakers, the sentence might actually be true with B, because we saw from Yunhee Kim's findings that Korean does actually allow pronouns to be interpreted kind of like reflexes. So with, with complex reflexes, John said that Peter drew Taziji himself. Both learner groups should be completely target-like, only allow the sentence with B not. However, for John said that Peter drew ZG, we expect English speakers to only allow local readings, so B but not A, but Korean speakers should actually allow both if they're transferring the availability of simplex pronouns with long distance readings from Korean. Here are the data. With pronouns, all three groups are happy to accept the pronoun with the long distance readings, and the Korean group in yellow also over accepts it with local. The English speakers do not, only the Korean speakers. For complex reflexives, everybody's pretty much on target. Only local readings, not long distance. Finally, for the simplex reflexives, the native speakers are kind of split. They allow both local readings and long distance readings about 60% of the time. However, the learners from both groups overwhelmingly go for the local readings and not the long distance. 
So the load is defined for the most part with the complex reflexives, but with the simplex reflexives, we don't really see evidence of transfer from Korean to Mandarin. Korean speakers, just like English speakers, strongly prefer local readings of the Mandarin speech. What, you know, any possibility of transfer from Korean here seems to be overridden by a general overarching preference for local readers. Finally, on the pronoun, we do see very clear evidence of transfer. Korean speakers learning Mandarin over accept local readings um, of the pronoun in, in Mandarin, just as they over accepted local readings of the English pronoun in your thesis. Okay, so now I've given this flying overview of our various studies. Let me revisit the original research questions. First, um, what determines when trans, so this is just to reduce the questions. What determines when transfer of form meanings happens? Can learners acquire target form meaning mappings even when the L1 lacks an equivalent? And do learners acquire both explicit and implicit knowledge of the relevant phenomena? So first we regard to transfer. What determines when transfer happens? Well, across these studies, we've seen quite a bit of transfer. There is transfer of the binding properties of pronouns from Korean to both English and Mandarin. We've also seen transfer of the binding properties of reflexes from English to Mandarin. We've also seen transfer of scope interpretation from Mandarin to English. So clearly transfer happens, as many other studies have shown as well. However, we found quite a few places where transfer does not happen, even though potentially it could. Even though both Korean and Mandarin use demonstratives and numerals in many contexts where English uses articles, demonstratives and numerals are optional in Korean and Mandarin and are not subject to transfer. We see exactly the same performance among in these groups when tested in English, despite differences between Korean and Mandarin. Same picture with plural marking. Even though Korean has plural marking, it's used optionally and is apparently not subject to transfer. Again, Korean and Mandarin speakers behave exactly the same. Both are equally influenced by activity. In, um, so we've seen a couple of cases where transfer is apparently overridden by universals. In the domain of plural marking, learners fall back on the semantic of universal of atomicity. Any noun which can be atomic, which can be object denoting, is allowed to combine with, excuse me, with S, any noun which denotes a substance is not allowed to combine with this. We see semantic universals rather than at, um, at play, not transfer. We also kind of see this in the domain of binding. The very last study I showed, um, when learners are trying to figure out the meaning of simplex reflexives in Mandarin, the fact that there are one, Korean actually also has simplex reflexives which, which allow long distance binding, that doesn't seem to help. They fall back on local binding, which is the most frequent, the easiest to process, which could be viewed as a universal. If in doubt for how an anaphor is interpreted, how a reflexive anaphor is interpreted as in the L2, treat it as having only local. Moving on to our second question, can learners acquire the target form meaning mappings in the L2 that do not have an L1 equivalent? Well, again, the picture is twofold. We've seen that learners can overcome transfer and not just overcome transfer, but generally learn target meanings quite a bit. Learners whose native languages lack articles do exhibit sensitivity to missing articles, nevertheless. So at least the basic fact that single, single account nouns in English uh, require articles seems to be that's something that's very robust in the input and learners do acquire it, do exhibit sensitivity to missing articles. We've also seen that in the case of binding, Korean learners of English do start moving away from Korean and toward English. Interestingly, in this case, learners are actually successful at unlearning a particular interpretation. In Korean, you know, in a sentence like Mary painted her, her can be Mary, in English it cannot. So Korean speakers learning English have to lose a reading, and they do so even though there is no negative evidence in the case. One possible reason for how they might unlearn is that they recognize that pronouns in English have a different status in Korean, and rule I, the pragmatic rule preventing accidental, accidental co-reference, kind of kicks in. At the same time, we've also seen cases where learners do not become target-like despite ample available evidence. This is the case with plural marking. 
Our Lana groups had no idea that nouns like furniture or spinach don't take plural marking in it. In this case, we're guessing that learning has to happen on a case-by-case -case basis. In some languages, furniture and spinach account. In others, they MS. There's nothing universal here. You have to learn it on a case-by-case -case basis. And in fact, um, Tang et al. in their study do find ev some evidence um, of lexical frequency in this study. We would predict that, for example, learners might acquire the fact that furniture is a mess now before they acquire the fact that cutlery is a mess now, because they're much more likely to encounter furniture in, in Japan. So the reason for overall lack of success in this category is probably that learning is kind of slow and has to proceed on the basis of individual lexical. Um, another place where we saw that learners um, are completely not able to overcome L1 transfer is with quantifier scope. Even though Mandarin speakers learning English are potentially exposed to inverse scope readings in the input, they don't allow. Them. We think that this is because inverse scope is relatively rare. Even native English speakers disprefer inverse scope relative to surface scope. So it may be that the input is just not providing learners with enough information. Mian Jen in her, Wu in her dissertation is conducting a, an intervention study to examine whether flooding learners with input or alternatively explicitly instructing them about inverse scope will help acquisition. And finally, with binding, we saw that learners of Mandarin as a second language are very resistant to ZG having a long distance interpretation. Again, we think this is a case where frequency in the input is very important. Um, local readings are much more frequent than long distance, might, are preferred even by native speakers. And so again, learners might simply not be getting enough relevant. And our final question, do learners acquire both implicit and explicit knowledge? The answer is largely yes. With plural marking, our learners were quite equally um, before the, the same online as offline. They recognize that nouns like sunlight do not take S. They did equally well online and offline. For nouns like furniture, they did equally poorly online and offline. In the case of articles, we actually saw that learners do somewhat better online than offline. And they tended to ignore um, missing articles in the grammatical of the judgment test much of the time, but still noticed missing articles in the online test. So to the extent that the self-based reading test can inform us about underlying implicit knowledge, we find that learners do have it. When it comes to knowing at least something about how articles and plural marking is used in English, learners are not limited just to explicit knowledge. They are, they, that knowledge has become automatized they do slow down for errors with missing articles and missing plural for most of the context. So to conclude, these findings paint a rather nuanced picture of the role of transfer in SLA of syntax semantics interface phenomena. We see transfer for those phenomena that are obligatorily encoded in the L1, but not for ones that are only optionally encoded. We see that transfer can be overridden by considerations of frequency and by semantic universals. And we see that whether learners are able to acquire a new form meaning mapping um, largely depends um, on the nature of the input as well as the nature of the So I would like to thank all of my students whose work I presented today, as well as our undergraduate assistants and our statistical consultant and the National Science Foundation, which has funded my students' dissertation projects um, and has made this work possible. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya. Um, there is time for questions. Uh, there is one raised hand, and there is one question in the Q and A. So, um, we raise hand. Okay. so I cannot actually see the raised hands. But I can see the Q and A. Okay. Uh, so maybe you start with the Q and A, or maybe I can. Uh, I so I can quickly, sorry, there's one Q&A which I can fairly quickly answer. Mm -hmm. uh, question is from Katerina Derkart. Did you only use concrete nouns in the first experiment? If so, what would you expect to see if you controlled for concreteness and abstractness? Yes, in the study reported here, we only use concrete nouns, but the study reported here was actually a follow-up to previous offline study, which is published in Second Language Research, that study was very explicit, very offline. In that study, we did test half concrete nouns, half abstract, and the results were pretty much the same. Abstract nouns were generally a little more difficult for learners, but
but the facts of atomicity held exactly this. So maybe we should go to the raised hands, and Natalia, do you mind? Uh, right, so this is by Anders, and Anders, you are now allowed to talk. Oh, so you can help now? Yeah, I need to allow. <laughs> I see, I didn't find that button. Uh, hi, Tanya, I'm Anders from Sweden, and I have a question um, about the first self-paced reading experiment with the missing articles. Mm -hmm. And I think we discussed this maybe a few years ago in Berlin when you presented mm -hmm. the ongoing work there. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't we expect uh, the learners to slow down when they read the noun without having read the article before, independently of whether the missing article is ungrammatical in their grammar? Because the article, um, uh, of course, uh, tells you that a noun will follow, right? Mm -hmm. independently of whether the missing article is ungrammatical or not, I would expect them to slow down when they meet the noun without having seen the article before. Yes, um, you're right. I mean, I do remember that comment and we do actually address this in some of our work. I didn't have a chance to go into this here. So basically there, uh, if we look at these kinds um, of scenario, it doesn't matter if we take the definite or the indefinite uh, sample um, token set, there are two reasons for why native English speakers might slow down in he cleaned what. One could be detection of ungrammaticality. The other could be more like prediction. Um, there in he cleaned the monitor, the presence of there predicts that there should be an noun follow. Yeah. In the case of he cleaned monitor, the verb by itself doesn't predict a noun to follow. So it could be that the monitor is read faster after an article because the article predicted it. Um, for learners, of course, the question is, have these learners from articles native languages really integrated English articles in their gram? Um, if they haven't, they wouldn't necessarily get a predictive effect from that to much. But it's true that with this design, we don't know exactly what learners are doing. Are they recognize, or for that matter, native speakers? Are they recognizing an error or are they predicting? We did run a follow-up study with both the definite and the indefinite, um, in which instead of a missing article, we had an incorrect article. So in the indefinite set, it, the comparison would be between she finally got a cat versus she finally got the cat, where there's no cat previously mentioned. Um, the, the results for the indefinites, which um, they are actually published um, in second language research together with uh, original, the original study and the follow-up study together, in the results, the effects were much weaker when we were dealing with, un with wrong article instead of missing article. Uh, but they were still present with indefinite. With definite, we got nothing. We got a null result. So the fact that we were able to get the effect with indefinite for the wrong article suggests it cannot be just prediction. Um, because both the and A successfully uh, predict the following noun, the issue really does seem to be about detecting which article is correct. The reason why these results were much weaker is probably that the, that's my interpretation, is that the error of a missing article is much more kind of robust and in your face. Wait, I'm a speaker of English, there's no article, that's really wrong. Yeah. Whereas to get that, okay, they is kind of bad here relative to A, you really have to integrate the, this mini discourse and figure out and have a sort of expectation. So I would argue that the fact that we were able to get an effect with ungrammatical articles, incorrect articles, suggests that it can't be just prediction. But since the effects are kind of weak, I'm, I cannot be 100%. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. OK, I think uh, Rumiana had a question. And Rumiana, I think you can talk now. So if you unmute your microphone. Um, yeah, I don't know. So we can't hear Rumiana, but so her question is, um, do you have any idea why learners are doing better online versus the grammaticality judgment task with articles? Yes. Thank you, Rumiana, and it would be nice to see you. <laughs> I don't know where you are. Um, right. We do go into that in our paper um, on the topic. So 
basically we think that the issue real the relevant issue methodologically is probably not online versus offline but rather what exactly does the task require learners to do in the online task in the self-paced reading specifically we have learners processing the sentence one word at a time as they get to each word they're making at some level not explicitly but at some level they're making a quick decision about is this integrated into the sentence is it good is it bad but they really get to do that one word at a time in the global gjt the kind that we use in these experiments learners get a whole sentence and basically get asked, so do you think the sentence is okay or not? And it's very easy in that case to ignore a part of that sentence. Um, articles are apparently highly non salient for learners. So they're looking at the sentence, they're thinking, well, verbs okay, tense is okay, all the words are there, word order is okay, yes, I'll say it's fine. Um, we did run a follow up um, in which um, the but that was actually so that was in the study with um, where the articles were incorrect instead of missing we also changed the format of the gjt we made it a much more explicit much more focused gjt we highlighted the phrase the part of the sentence where the error potentially could be and asked them is this part of the sentence correct and they they were perfect they had no problems whatsoever identifying article errors once their attention was attracted to the part of the sentence where the error so we really think that a global GJT um, the, basically allows learners to miss errors very easily that they actually otherwise might attempt to. Um, so the performance is much more similar if between a self-based reading task where they process the sentence one at a time and a much more explicit GJT where they get to look for an error in a specific there is a nice paper by Orfitali and Polanski, which actually argues that the global GJT might underestimate learners' knowledge precisely because it requires learners to, you know, process, take the full sentence and try to figure out what exactly is going on. They might actually be better in some other types. So that just, I think, goes to show that we can't always assume that learners will do better offline than online. We have to look at what exactly the phenomenon is and what it does. Uh, Romiana, do, do you have a follow-up or? I no, uh, I couldn't get into the conversation for a while, so I only uh -huh. heard half of Tanya's answer, but I will uh, follow up on email. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I guess there is a question by Cecile. Yes, hi. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, we can. Hi, thanks. Um, this is about uh, something that you said in passing, it's not really the focus of your talk, but I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on the possible role of negative evidence uh, in case where you think naturalistic input tends to be a bit too ambiguous. And I was thinking about that in relation to the acquisition of the long distance uh, anaphores uh, in the Mandarin study. So could you comment on that? So. Well, in the Mandarin study, are you talking about the reflexive part or the, so the availability of long distance readings for reflexives or simply reflexives? Yeah. So, I mean, it goes a little bit beyond what you, you spoke about mm -hmm. specifically, but so it's really, if you could expand a little bit based on what you talked about today on what you believe the role of ne negative evidence should be, because, you know, there's a bit of a shift in the field at the moment. I'm just mm -hmm. curious to hear your thoughts. Right. So actually, if you don't mind, I will go to scope first, because really the, the study of, on scope is really the one where we have been giving this a lot of thought. So this is me and Jen's um, dissertation. So um, in the case of scope, we're dealing with a situation where positive evidence really should be enough. Um, learners, you know, our inverse scope is exists in English. If you just hear enough sentences like every horse didn't jump in a context where some horses jumped and some didn't, that should be enough. Um, that's obviously enough for English acquiring children um, event to eventually figure out um, that um, inverse scope exists. Yet for our learners, despite pretty advanced proficiency and immersion in English, it's not enough. So the question we ask that Mia Jen is actually asking in her dissertation is what, what would allow learners to acquire inverse scope? do they need more positive evidence or do they really need well maybe negative evidence in this case is not exactly the right term but do they need explicit instruction so she's actually for her dissertation conducting an intervention study in which um half the participants 
get input flooding, get lots and lots of uh, context in which the, center, the relevant sentence is true in inverse scope, but without any explanations of what's going on. While half the participants get less data, less actual input, but get explicit information about inverse scope, essentially get taught that inverse scope exists. While her dissertation study is in progress, she has collected enough data to be able to make some conclusions. And what we find is that in this case, input flooding does basically nothing. The lotus who get all this exposure to inverse scope still don't get it. They get a tiny, tiny improvement, but which quickly disappears. So it's, of course, one could always say, well, maybe they need even more input. Maybe this wasn't enough. The group that got explicit instruction does wonderfully. They totally get inverse scope in English, but they get it in a very, very narrow way. They only get it for the structure they are extracted on. They don't generalize it to any related structures. If anything, they generalize it to the wrong place. I don't want to go into detail here, but we very strongly think, based on these results, that explicitly teaching learners about a semantic phenomena is not the way to get them to really interpret. So that's kind of part of my answer, is that at least for very subtle semantic phenomena, explicitly telling learners about it is probably not going to lead to target knowledge. Now, in the case of binding, the situation is a bit different because here we have, such, we have contexts where learners actually need, might actually need negative evidence. So for example, if we look at what is going on with an effort in Mandarin, Korean speakers have to unlearn the possibility um, that ku, uh, that pronouns have local readings. They have to unlearn it in Mandarin as well as in English. Um, and in both studies, in both the Mandarin and the English studies, the Korean speakers are only slightly over accepting of pronouns um, with local readings, um, even, though, you know, even though these are allowed in Korean. So they do seem to be on their way to figuring out that this is not allowed. And here the question becomes, how are they doing this without negative evidence? This isn't the sort of thing they actually get instructed upon. Evidence in the input, of course, overwhelmingly shows them English as well as Mandarin, depending on the language, <coughs> excuse me, pronouns that don't have local readings. But, you know, is that enough to figure out that they cannot have local We, I think that what is probably going on here is that Pronouns in Korean are a, diff a somewhat different kind of category than pronouns in English. There's a lot of debate in what pronouns in Korean are exactly. Are they some kind of a semi-demonstrative? So they are somewhat different category. So what I think is going on is that with enough exposure to English or to Mandarin input, the Korean speakers figure out that the pronouns in those languages are true pronouns, which is a category that should be given to them by universal grammar. And once they recognize the pronouns, principle B, rule I, everything should kick in, and they should disallow local. So that's my take on what is going on with that. Um, in the case of reflexes, you know, depending on the directionality, speak, learners of Mandarin actually have to acquire a new meaning of reflexes, um, while learners of English, if they're speaking Korean or Mandarin, have to lose a meaning of reflexes. The, there, there are many studies on this topic, and they don't really bear out learning somehow being easier than unlearning. Um, so I do think that a lot has to depend on the input. If there's not enough, simply the fact that a given form meaning mapping exists in the input is not enough to learn. Uh, it's not enough for learners to get it. Um, there has to be, it has to be very robust in the input. It has to be readily available. On the other hand, simply because a given form meaning mapping is absent in the input, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's unlearnable. You really have to look at each specific case and kind of think of what is it that the learners have to learn? Do they have to change the category of the reflexive a pronoun? Do they have to recognize that it's a different type of lexical item than in their L1? If they do, then all the corresponding properties should kind of kick in. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Okay, thank you. I guess uh, Gillian is next. If you want to ask a question, Gillian. So, uh, Gillian just left. Do you hear me? Yeah. I think, I, I mean, did you see her question? She basically wondered about the fact that, uh, especially her, like many pronouns, and her can be used as a possessive pronoun, and there it's locally bound often. So the fact that you find that pronoun, it could be locally bound. 
possibly also after some prepositions, right? She looked behind her or something like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could mess up the, the input and... Right. So the question here is, could it be that the reason learners think that her is local in English is because they hear things like Mary likes her friends? In that case, we would presumably expect a difference between her and him because yeah. him and his are different lexical objects. So one part of the answer is, as far as I know, she found no difference between her and him. The other part of the answer is there have been quite a few studies on L2 acquisition on pronouns, and the Korean speakers seem to be the only group who have difficulty with pronouns. Mm. No other group does. So that would suggest that it's probably not about the input, but really about the L1 in this particular case. Thanks. Can I ask a question too, or is there a line there, Natalia? Sorry, no, you can go. Uh, yeah, so I wonder a little bit about the different methods here, you online, offline. It's, it was obvious that that was the difference, but especially in the two first cases with the, with the articles and the uh, plural, those are, they should be so frequent in, in, any, uh, in any spoken conversation, in written conversation, it should be quite easy to accept, uh, access uh, data from, from corpora there and compare between different L2s and, um, and, and, and ask the same question. So I, I wonder, Lilith, what do you think about, say, spontaneous uh, production or even enlisted production? And, and how would you, uh, where would you locate it between the, say, the, the offline and the online? And, uh, and would it provide better or possibly more accurate data on, on some of, of these issues? Yeah. So I think, yeah, you bring up a very important point. Online and offline is obviously not the only distinction. Um, as you noticed, you know, all, all of the research I presented here was all about comprehension and judgments. Of course, production is the other big side of this. So we can have production as well as comprehension data, all, and production data can potentially be either offline or online. If it's spoken production, it's kind of by definition online, um, yeah. if it's timed production. I think to get a full picture, we really need all the different methods because any individual method can be critiqued. When learners make errors in production, the question arises, are they making these errors because they truly lack the underlying representation or because they cannot access that representation, representation under the pressure of production? So clearly learners are different from native speakers. So if they do very well in comprehension and they don't do so well in production, that at least allows us to pinpoint the nature of the difference. They have the representation, it's there, they can access it even online very fast when processing the language. Whatever is going on, the difficulty is specifically in retrieval during production. So that's, that's the thing you know, to explain. Um, Tres Bruder has a very nice paper that bears on this, uh, Tres Bruder and colleagues, which is on grammatical gender in Spanish, where they show, you know, they do both comprehension and production, both online and offline, and they really try to pinpoint with very advanced participants exactly what they get wrong. So I think definitely be extremely fruitful to do more of that um, with different kinds of configurations within the same slide base. I've, I've been working mainly on comprehension and processing, which is, you know, that way we can, we can get more participants that way, uh, but I do think it would ultimately be interesting to triangulate with all the different methods. Okay, thanks. Right. Um, are there any more questions? Can, can we just ask her? I don't know how to raise my hand. Sorry, uh, Natalia. It's Jason. Uh, yeah. Tanya. So, so um, Tanya. So, mm -hmm. f f firstly, thanks. This was fantastic, and I, I want to. I don't know if this will be the final one, but if it is, end with a question about the generalizations you've offered. Can you go to the the penultimate slide then, where you talk about your the, the generalizations? Um. Right, so I, I just wanted to, to see what, what insights you might have or want to offer about the, the general picture of what, of what you have. So what stands out to me is, you know, uh, L1 transfer appears to affect obligatory but not optional phenomena. Can, can you say something about what you think, um, why that might be, um, what you think this might indicate, and if, if I could say something before, before you do that, I, I, I wonder, um, if, first off, I, I didn't catch from you, if you could just say briefly, what, what is the proficiency level 
um, of the people that you're mm -hmm. testing across these uh, various studies? They're all, we, we will classify them all as intermediate to advanced. In the case of uh -huh. all the studies on L2 English, we pretty much use the same professional test, which is the one Selena and I have used in prior work. They all uh -huh. play kind of high intermediate advanced and they're all students at our, mostly at our university. So clearly their English is good enough to get into a major US university for undergraduate or okay. graduate. Okay. Okay. So they're pretty good, definitely not native like, but fairly advanced. Okay, so so then any any uh, any effect that that you would attribute backwards to to L one uh, transfer is is at that point a lingering effect, right? Something that mm -hmm. you know a priori would be predicted to to continue, you know, uh, to to be pervasive or to, mm -hmm. to be an indelible mark in the grammar. So I, I wonder if you know back to the original question, what insight you might have. I, I wonder if it might be the case that um, it, it, there is really something special about phenomena that are optional in somebody's mm -hmm. first language, um, and how this is then brought to um, a second language. And if then looking at learners at such an advanced level. Uh, might be the best test case to comment on, and I don't think that you are trying to comment on this, by the way, but comment on whether or not L1 transfer itself might have been something that happened at a lower level proficiency, but the stochastic nature of, you know, the distribution of things that can and cannot map onto something that, that is or is not in the L2 might allow for the space of universals to come in um, Whereas that's not the case when something's obligatory, because you, your data seems to be pretty pretty straightforward that if something was obligatory, um, you do even still at this late level of proficiency, mm -hmm. lingering effects of transfer in the first place. So. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, yes, and now of course, since we are looking at fairly advanced proficiency, we cannot make direct claims about what happened early. And certainly, if we find cases of participants being completely target-like, that's not a reason to claim, oh, there's no transfer. Well, maybe it was there earlier, it's just gone. However, I do want to stress that the participants, so going back to these studies on articles and plural marking, the participants are not target-like. Offline, in the GGT, they have huge amounts of over-acceptance. Online, they show effects, but not in every condition. So basically, if transfer had happened earlier, the story would be kind of convoluted. We'd have to say, well, the Korean speakers started out, you know, transferring the meaning of the plural marking or the meaning of an article, but then stopped transferring it, but nevertheless did not become trouble. So to make this concrete, let's say in the domain of atomicity, we see that both Korean and Mandarin speakers are sensitive to incorrect S on substance mass nouns like sunlight, but a non-target like an object mass nouns like furniture. Now, I'm guessing that if we had managed to look at very low level, low proficiency learners, they would probably miss plural marking errors everywhere, right? It's quite likely that they are, after all, coming from a native language um, with, without obligatory plural marking, they might simply not notice any errors whatsoever. And that could, in a sense, be an effective choice. But then we are asking more specifically, OK, so Koreans, Korean uses plural marking to essentially mark atomicity, uses it with furniture, not with sunlight. Mandarin does not. So there is no reason to expect Mandarin speakers to be better with sunlight than with furniture. If all we have is L1 transfer followed by recovery from transfer, then Mandarin speakers should start out not allowing S anywhere, not detecting errors with S anywhere, and then should eventually move to being native-like and detecting incorrect S. There is absolutely no reason to expect the asymmetry between furnitures and sunlights among Mandarin speakers. While for Korean speakers, this asymmetry actually is expected or not. So that's why I strongly, in this particular case, I very strongly argue that there is no L1 transfer, because L1 transfer, with Korean speakers, we could say it is, but with Mandarin speakers, L1 transfer would predict no distinction between atomic and non-atomic mass nouns, especially given that we control them in parts. The only way to explain this in between why nouns like furniture are more difficult than nouns like sunlight, well, because atomic nouns in principle can be. So in this case, I think we can really make the case that it's not trans. Um, with articles, actually, based on the data I, show, um, I showed you, it's, it's 
not as obvious with articles because here what we're finding is that all our participants do manage to detect missing articles with singular nouns. So here one might say, well, when they start out, maybe they started out with L1 transfer, which would have been not detecting any errors with articles, and now we see them where they recovered from transfer, and hence they do detect errors with articles. However, when it comes to the fine-grained, you know, distinctions between, say, anaphoric and bridging definites, or referential and refer non-referential indefinites, we would expect, especially since Salonis, you know, they're not super high proficiency, they're high intermediate to advanced. If transfer was helping them, they should have gone from missing, you know, completely failing to detect article errors to detecting them more successfully in those contexts where, which are marked by determinants in the L1 than in those that are not. So it seems unlikely to me that we would completely miss that stage, that we are, you know, get absolutely no difference among any of these learners between the different kinds of deafness or Since clearly they haven't fully recovered, they still make lots of errors, but there are no distinctions. So that kind of addresses the question of whether we can still talk about transfer with advanced learners. I think yes, because our learners are not anywhere near transfer. As for the optional obligatory distinction, I think one helpful hypothesis here, I haven't mentioned it on the slides, but we do discuss it in some of our papers, and that's the morphological congruency hypothesis of Zhang, Nanjang, and colleagues. Um, they argue that learners will be more successful at activating, at automatically accessing an L2 morpheme online if there is an equivalent in their L1. So we try to push this a step further and say, what does it mean to have an equivalent morpheme in the L1? What if that morpheme is only optionally used in the L1? Is that enough to automatically activate it online? The answer is no. Um, apparently, if congruency plays a role, it really has to be full congruency. That morpheme, that morpheme has to be used in close to 100% of the relevant context in your L1 for you to be able to activate it in your L2. Um, otherwise, if it's only used for some of the time and not consistently, and the form without it is perfectly grammatical, there is no reason for you to detect an error. So again, going back to plural marking, why aren't they detecting an error on, say, furnitures with S? Well, in Korean, the tool, the plural marker, is allowed on furniture, but the absence of tool is also allowed. So nothing in their L1 actually tells them that, wait a second, this is a place where plural marking would be ungrammatical. It actually is perfectly grammatical. Um, we did have one more study, which I didn't report here, which looked at what happens with definites. The one context in Korean, the plural definites, because the one context in Korean where plural marking actually is obligatory is to expect express plural meaning with definites. So if it's something like demonstrative book and you want it to refer to two books, you have to use the two plural. And in that context, the Korean speakers are actually much better in English than they are in corresponding indefinite context. So that, um, so that would be my answer for why optionality doesn't transfer. You know, and this is specific to morphemes, right? Articles and plurals. In order for your L1 to help you process the L2, it really has to be the case that the, un that, that the ungrammaticality in the L2 corresponds to the ungrammaticality in the L1. That morphing being missing has to be bad in both languages. If in the L1 that morphing is only optionally used and its omission doesn't result in ungrammaticality, then, then you don't get it. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, I think the intuition is right. I mean, I'm glad that you said, um, you know, and I don't know if you intended, but that the, this is potentially something that's specific to, to morphology, because, you know, when you think about things that are essentially probabilistic, let's say relative mm -hmm. clause attachment and other things, of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you can look at lots of things that mm -hmm. are probabilistic in a way that, you know, you can attach high, you can attach low. And there's mm -hmm. some pretty good evidence to suggest that those strategies, if their strategies uh, work, um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, transfer that is. Um, so, you know, it's interesting because here you're talking mm -hmm. about a question of whether something's grammatical or not. And of course, it's always an option. Um, so I don't know what transfer means in the sense of optionality, actually, when you're reducing mm -hmm. it to something that is more of a syntactic, because it's not, I mean, again, you have this almost indirect subset, superset, that, that, that the lack of using something that is an option in your language is still 
grammatical if you don't do it. And maybe there's some mm -hmm. processing and or other considerations mm -hmm. or that leaves the gate open for just, you know what, let's start. There's too much optionality. There's stuff going on here. We start from the universal and we move forward and that may be what mm -hmm. you see. But yeah, thank you very much. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. I see that uh, somebody raised their hand. I guess we only have qu uh, time for one question. Uh, Dora, you can go. Yes, hi, thanks a lot hi. for the very nice talk. So yeah, the question came to me as uh, I was listening to your answer to Jason. So, okay, I understand the point about the optionality, but so do you think then that transfer is something that happens not only even morphing by morphing or feature by feature, but it's almost sounded like it's, you know, context by context or construction by construction. And, you know, if that is <clears throat> the level where we study and we think about transfer, I don't know, what does this theoret mean theoretically? I guess, you know, maybe you don't want to go all the way to parameter or think, well, actually, I think in the case of the number, perhaps there is a way of thinking about the typological differences between mm -hmm. um, uh, Chinese and, uh, uh, so Mandarin and uh, Korean versus English that might be blocking transfer of these features that ultimately are very semantic, but you know, mm -hmm. really positively transfer them. Maybe you actually need to reset the parameter. But uh, so I don't know. It's a genuine question where you stand because I understand, of course, theoretically, we probably all of us want to think in terms of parameters, but then it, empirically you start finding that you know when it almost I you know when you almost have an identical context and case in the L1 where something is obligatory then you get an effect and when things you know in a different very similar get different construction things are different is there any space for you know generalization or thinking about this transfer effect in terms of features or in terms of yeah anything resembling parameters or anything a little bit more abstract I'm not sure if uh, the yeah, no, that's, that's a very good question. And you're right that there are a lot of kind of big, bigger issues here. I guess thinking specifically about morphology, um, I do find it more helpful to think maybe in terms of features than parameters. Like, for example, in Donald Ardier's feature assembly framework, that it's not simply, okay, the L1 has plural marking, the L2 has plural marking versus the L1 doesn't, the L2 does. You really have to look at the specification of this morpheme. And the features largely correspond to the kind of context in which the morpheme is used. For example, the plural marker is obligatory in definite contexts in Korea, but is optional in indefinite context. So it's not context by con it's not context by context in the sense of you know any specific lexical context has to be treated separately, but in the case of semantic context, there is more, it's not simply plus plural or minus plural. We have to look at the exact meaning of this context or of a given morpheme and exactly where it is used, and then the predictions for L1 transfer can become extremely specific. For it's these particular features on the morpheme are subject to transfer, this is where learners will succeed, this is where they will fail. Now, how much that will transfer over to more syntactic issues, I cannot, you know, kind of readily say, but that's sort of my view of how it happens with morphemes. You're right, that's something to think about more. Okay, so I guess that was our time. And thank you very much to the speaker and to all of you for listening and asking questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was very nice having you here, Tanya. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Well, very nice to see everybody. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Well, have, thank you. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Mm. Okay. Mm.